when I was a kid and hearing this gospel passage in church, I remember thinking distinctly, this could use a good editor. For four times, we hear the same words of being hungry or thirsty, and you gave me drink, stranger, naked, and you clothed me, sick, and you visited me in prison, and you came to see me. Four times we hear this repeated in just a few verses. I was very sure we could save almost two minutes. But if we notice this repetition, surely Matthew, who was considered a pretty good writer, would have known that it was repetitive as well. So we have to think or give, at least conceive of giving Matthew the credit for knowing what he was doing. For within just a few verses, we hear these same actions four times. So the real question arises to you who listen, did you hear it? Did you hear it? For here we have Christ, King of the universe, as we call him now, coming in the fullness of his glory, coming to be seated at the right hand of his heavenly Father in heaven, surrounded by the angels singing in the fullness of glory. And we hear that what he's looking for are some pretty basic things. Feeding the hungry giving water to someone who's thirsty, visiting the imprisoned, clothing the naked. For we have to understand that what we see here is a bit of a clash of vision. We see this heavenly court in the fullness of glory and splendor. And yet the one who is taking the seat next to the very throne of God is one who came into our world as one like us, who came to set us free, and who bears with him on that heavenly throne the very marks of his suffering and death, the holes in his hands and feet, the hole in his side, bearing with him the fullness of his human excursion. And even more importantly, we have to understand that this Jesus is also identifying himself with those who hunger and those who thirst and those who are naked and those who are imprisoned. And in fact, we have to understand not only is he identifying himself with them in our world today, that his journey to that heavenly realm came through being hungry and being thirsty, I thirst, and being stripped naked on the cross and having been imprisoned. Jesus understands these realities implicitly and explicitly and in his very being. And so the message Matthew is giving us today is that at the end of time, when we are standing before the judgment seat of heaven alone and as nations and as a church, God may be looking at how we enflesh all of the moral codes and teachings that we profess and sometimes spend lots of time thinking about and articulating and holding each other accountable to, but that what seems to be the final determinant or the principal one is did we notice the people around us and take care of their very basic human need? For God identifies with us in our humanity and this human journey we each make. It's much of what he was saying through the prophet in our first reading. 
that there are going to be shepherds out there. There are going to be those who are supposed to be taking care of you, who aren't, who are taking care of themselves. And so that God identifies himself as a good shepherd, a phrase we hear picked up again in the New Testament. God identifies himself as the one who cares, who will notice, then stand in the midst of his sheep and look out and, and take care of each and every one of them. That is the image of the good shepherd God. We get from the, the Old Testament even earlier in the book of Genesis an image, another image of kingship where we are given as humanity in, in Genesis dominion over the earth to subdue it and to cultivate it. This has been misunderstood in the broken nature of human kingship. But in the kingship of God, as we read it through the Old Testament, a kingship of care and nurturing and responsibility, we have to see that this good shepherd God is now enfleshed in our bodies and his care for the least among us can only happen through us. The hungry, the thirsty, the naked, and the imprisoned. The question God is going to be asking us is, do you even see them? And what did you do? There are many complicated political and internationally political questions about these matters. And as faithful people, as educated people, as people who participate in the power structures of our world, there are many things we can do to influence policy, to write to senators and TDs, to hear our, have our voices heard about those things which are very important, to support different charities, whether it be CrossCare or Troker or any of the other NGOs. There's many things we can do. But we have to put it into action, a principle I first learned as an undergraduate in a, in a group I was a part of. Think globally, but act locally. What did you do today? Because the needs of people are real. And God's goodness and God's grace will be encountered through you. Increasingly, we hear from Pope Francis that this other idea of stewardship or dominion is also important for almost 10 years now, building on the work of hundreds and thousands of others. Francis has been calling us to bring this same focus to the very world itself, to creation itself. And for us to get our heads out of the sand. One of my favorite expressions as a kid, it was so vivid to me, was something was like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Perhaps another one similar and a little bit probably harsher was Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Francis and many people are telling us ecological realities climate change is not an issue to be addressed. It is the primary and fundamental reality that we have to get our mind around and we have to bring every part of our being to bear on looking at what's going on and how we can help solve it. For the hungry and the thirsty of our world are going to get hungrier and thirstier with just a degree change in base climate temperatures. Millions of people will starve. Others will be flooded out with water they can't drink. That what's happening in our world is cataclysmic. And we have to address it. And we have to be willing to address it. We have to stop thinking it'll be okay. Because it won't. And what Francis is calling us to, it will be okay because we live in hope. But it won't be okay because we do nothing. What Francis is calling us to is a broader sense of our own responsibility 
to help manage the future of the earth, to make sure that the west does, of Ireland doesn't get inundated with torrential floods several times a year, to make sure that the east of Ireland, Dublin, doesn't suffer cataclysmically because our drier summers mean less rainwater and in a city that doesn't have decent reservoirs will mean drought. There are things that we can't fix, but we can help address. If we put ourselves in a spirituality of ecology, which means that our concern for the people of our world is our concern for the world itself, and that we allow ourselves to be transformed and buoyed by true hope, a hope that means what I do can bring change. Not in and of itself, not singularly, but if we all pull together. Some of this means, and I know I've said it before, we have to be mindful of little things our mother told us. When the heat's on, shut the door. Turn off the water. Don't let it run. Perhaps when you're feeling chilly, put on a sweater. Don't turn up the heat. And there are bigger things we can do about taking care of our homes and insulation and alternative forms of energy. All of these things, none of them is the truth. All of them are ways and means to try to achieve an end which we should be concerned about. So that the poor, the oppressed, and the marginalized don't get further pushed out of the picture. And that we do something to save our common home. And so today, we celebrate the Feast of Christ the King. And it sounds like it's a dire situation. It is. It's a difficult situation. But we celebrate the Feast of Christ the King because he represents our hope and all that can be. Not a mindless hope or a wishing but the hope that if we put our trust in God, we open ourselves to his grace and his guidance, we ask for wisdom and courage, we can collectively move this world to a new place. We can help address issues of poverty and loneliness. We can free the imprisoned, if only with words of hope. We are called today to participate as members of the body of Christ in the saving action of Jesus Christ. It is our fundamental call. It is the greatness of our faith. May we each commit ourselves to taking some small step, perhaps even tonight, to make the future a more hospitable and better place and to help bring forth the fullness of the kingdom of God.